interviews. Now, for most of you, you know I'm normally doing these Duru interviews on Thursday. But, you know, this week, Thursday, it happens to be Thanksgiving. So I just had to get out here and make sure we get you guys ready for that turkey. I'm going to fill you up with some fantastic information from one of my good friends, Mr. Mike Rosecca. Mike, say hi to everybody, my good friend. Hey, everybody. Charles, thanks a lot, man. This is awesome. Most of you, you know Getting I'm ready normally for the doing these Duru interviews on Thursday. But you hear me? I hear you loud and clear, Mike. Thank you very much. And right now, yeah. I want to let everybody know that this will be a 30-minute brain dump from somebody who I consider as one of the best, in my eyes, the best when it comes to note investing um, for real estate investors. Now, as you can see, the title of the topic is How to Invest in Real Estate Notes, the Insider Secrets from a Real Estate Jedi Note Master. Now, Mike, I know the first question that everybody is wondering how did you get in note investing? It was a random email. Uh, I had no desire to be in the note business. Uh, a good friend of mine had been talking about it for a while. Uh, I received a random email about note investing in the uh, beginning of 2007. I sent it over to my buddy and um, calls me up three weeks later. And he's like, so what do you think of those calls? I'm like, what calls? What are you talking about? He said, that email that you sent me, that email, get on those calls. I had no desire. I was a hammer swinger, a rehabber. You know, I, I ended up buying a house next door to me and rehabbing that house. Um, I just figured I had to improve the value of a property to make money. And um, I was that was the furthest thing from the truth because rehabbing houses, that's work. And I found this business, it's not work. It's easy, it's fun, and it's lucrative. And um, I thank my friend every time I talk to him for sending me that, over that email. He's, no, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I was able to learn this business with a lot of uh, real good note investors that are still in the business today, thir almost 13 years ago now. And uh, some, some pretty successful people came out of those original um, uh, recordings that we were studying, and uh, we just never looked back. Nice. Now, I want to first and foremost let everybody know this is going to be your opportunity to really pick the brain of a Jedi master when it comes to note investing. Everybody that's on Facebook, don't please feel free. YouTube, uh, Twitch, uh, Instagram, I want each and every one Please feel free to ask questions. And right now we have Lorraine on the broadcast. We have James on the broadcast. Greg on the broadcast. My man D. Stevens just shared the video. Thank you, D, for sharing that for us, my brother. Minion is on the broadcast. And my beautiful wife, Tammy Blair, is on the broadcast. Thank you, thank you, thank each and every nice. one of you guys. Now, Mike, a lot of people in this business is taught that the success that you have is measured by the money you make. How do you feel about that? Well, money is a good indicator. If you're not doing something right, I don't chase money. Um, I don't, I don't pursue it as I, I know that if I'm helping people, I'm going to get paid. And the more people I can get into this business, uh, and, and it's really a win, win, win for the, uh, for the industry as well. So when a, a bank sells me a non-performing mortgage, it's a win for them because they've been able to write that mortgage down to zero on their books. And by the time they write it down to zero, if they sell it to me for 20 cents on the dollar, that 20 cents goes to their bottom line profit. Mm -hmm. When I first heard that from Wells Fargo, I almost hit the floor. <laughs> I, and then I, I, I just couldn't believe it. That bottom line figure went to their price their their profit line so they wrote down a hundred thousand dollar mortgage to twenty thousand dollars and now they turned a hundred into twenty and they think that they're smart you know um so it's a win for them to get that zero off their books and then when i'm working with the borrower 
we can offer them a deal because of that discount to keep them in their house. And we give them a portion of that discounted amount in the form of lower interest rate or a lower monthly payment. And it's a win for the borrower. And of course, it's a win for my company as we are able to buy these things at a, at a deep discount and then start making uh, collections, uh, collecting on, on these payments. Um, it, it's an amazing way. So money is a great indicator. But to be successful, you got to help a lot of people. That's all there is to it. Got you. Lorraine wants to know, what variety of note investing are there? Sure. There, there is unsecured debt, probably the riskiest debt, meaning unsecured debt is like credit card debt. There's credit card debt available to buy. If someone stops paying their credit card, uh, that loan sometimes does get discounted and sold out to an investor, usually in a big pool of loans, um, probably at basis points, meaning fractions of a penny. So if you have a $10,000 credit card, you may be able to pick that, that debt up for 500 bucks or something, something like that. Then you go into, I'll go from, from level risk. Uh, the riskiest being probably unsecured debt. And then the next, type of debt that we invest in is non-performing junior loans. Mm -hmm. Pretty risky uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, very risky if you don't know what you're doing. Like anything, you know, you get in a, in a car, if you've got an experienced driver, that car becomes a, fast, a fantastic tool, but in the wrong hands, it can be uh, a, a treacherous uh, ride for whoever's around. Absolutely. So you got to know what you're doing. Non-performing junior liens is, is my specialty. Uh, I like junior liens because I know that I have a borrower in the house that probably wants to stay there. And they are probably more willing to work with me because they are living in the house. They are paying their first mortgage. Uh, that That's an easier loan for us to work on. Uh, the next thing I consider more risky is uh, first position mortgages. Um, some people think I have that backwards, but there, there are several reasons why I like junior liens over first position. First position loans are more expensive. So right there, that changes the risk factor. You've got more money on the table and you've got a skinnier deal uh, when it comes to profit. So if you paid a lot more for it, that means there's less room for profit. Um, so there may not be that ability to work with the borrower the way we have the ability to work right, with the borrower. Right, got you. So that's why first liens are, I'm not opening beer bottles. That happens to be my uh, text message here. See? Um, so first liens, and then there's all types of different debt out there. Uh, that's primarily the space that we're looking at. There's auto loans, there's student loan debt, um, stuff that I don't even know how this country is going to work through the student loan debt crisis. I think that's our next crisis coming up. Interesting, interesting. One of the things you just mentioned um, revolved around non-performing and performing. What I found pretty striking is the fact that you you seem to be an expert in the non-performing stuff where others are gravitating to notes that are performing. What what makes that the niche that you really wanted to pick up and, and really gravitate to? Sure. Yeah, I, I just had this great conversation with uh, another investor who said, you know what, let me start out buying performing loans. It's easier, it's safer, and I steered him against it. I, I said, if you want to get into the non-performing note business, just buy some performing loans and wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a very nice thing, but <laughs> everybody's like, I want to get into non-performing notes. I go out and buy some performers and see what happens in the next six months to a year. Uh, especially when, when the market was uh, in such bad shape back in, in 2009 and 10, where the loans that I owned that were performing, they stopped performing. Uh, the country kind of came to a standstill as far as I was concerned back then. Uh, my borrowers stopped paying me. My tenants stopped paying me. I owned some rentals. And uh, 
So yeah, with purchasing non-performing loans, you're buying them at the cheapest point that they can be at. So you, you can you can hear me now, Charles, the pricing on these loans is everything. There's no bad loans, there's just bad pricing. Gotcha. And you can buy the ugliest note in the world, meaning the property is underwater, it's in a bad location, whatever. That note still has a value to it. It may be only two cents on the dollar or three cents on the dollar, but there is a value to that. And those things do pay off as well because you're talking about someone who's living in their house and uh, there's a, a lot of things happen when a person has to think about moving out of their house. There's a lot of emotion involved and there's a, a lot of people are able to actually fix a bad situation. And uh, so we've been very fortunate to have discovered this business early on prior to the meltdown. Uh, this business was here prior to the meltdown and it's here now as the economy is totally turned around. And we're looking at uh, rising real estate markets again. Mm -hmm. And we still have loans going into non-performance. So it's always going to be here. Lorraine asks, how should what how would one get started in the business if they wanted to get started doing note investing? Sure. Well, go do your due diligence. You want to find a, a I was going to say Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go find someone that you think you can work with that has some type of an education program. Uh, I lucked out by receiving that one random email all those years ago. And uh, this was a guy on Wall Street who taught us the business. He was good. He knew what he was doing. And we learned well. Uh, and then we, as students, stayed together after we had finished our formal note education. We stayed together to continue to work together to do deals. And so there are some note educators out there that are good. And you need to pair yourself up with them to see if their personality seems to be a fit with you. If they seem to be credible, you want to check around and make sure that the references that they have are, are good. Uh, I would probably say that find a note investor who's gone through a program that would be willing to give them a reference, uh, mm -hmm. a referral. And uh, I teach the note business been doing it for years now. I have a, a small program that I run on Thursdays, Thursday evenings, uh, which is a mentoring call. It's, it's under $2,000. It lasts for a whole year. Um, I am very proud of that program. It's the way I learned the business. And all these people are really joining a club when they, uh, when they come over into our, into our education program because everybody gets to talk to each other. And that's exactly how I did it. I had friends that I would run ideas by, and uh, that's that's essentially what I would do. Now, I, I know we briefly talked a little bit about who you are, but I want people to really understand the depth of exactly what you're doing, how many markets you're doing it in, and so on. So people can really understand just how much of a Jedi you are in this business. So give them that, give them that, 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 that synopsis of what it looks like, okay. your business. So I started buying rentals very local to me within blocks of my house. Uh, I thought that I had to be the boots on the ground. I had to be local to these properties that I was going to do my investing in. Had no idea that the note business was even here. Started buying rentals in 1999. Um, and then in 2007, I discovered this business. And my mentor said, absolutely, this is a nationwide business. Don't look for deals in your backyard because you're not going to find any. You have to comb the earth, <laughs> at least the, the continental US for deals uh, because it's a very small niche market, meaning e even with Wells Fargo at the time when we were buying from them, they were only releasing maybe 2000 loans for us to look at every month. So you may say, boy, 2000 loans is a lot. Well, there's a lot of note investors looking for those loans, right? Uh, 2000 loans from a big institution like that 
is, is, a, is a fairly small market. And uh, so you have to be ready and able and available to buy something in the part of the country that you have no idea what it's like over there. You, you just have no idea what it's like to be in, I don't know, Boston or Denver, Colorado, if you've never been there. You have to go where the bank tells you to go. Mm-hmm. You have to look at the loans that the bank has selected for you to look at. Uh, I get a lot of people that come to me and say, hey, listen, there's a house around the corner from me. It looks like it's abandoned. It's probably in foreclosure. Can I go after that house? And absolutely you can. You're going to have a harder time working with the bank because the bank has not said, you know what, let's dump this garbage off our books and take, take a write off for the year of 2019. So I find it very easy to go where the bank sends me. Uh, I have to look at the loans that they have said, yep, get these off the books, call Mike, get rid of these things. And uh, we do that on a weekly basis. So it sounds like you have pretty good relationship with a lot of the actual banks that you're working with. Yeah, right now we're only working with one. Okay. Um, which is scary. <laughs> I like to have more product than capital. And uh, so I've built a small team of students that are going out and assisting me in finding loans. I teach them the business and then they broker the loans through me and they get paid as a note broker. And I tell them what to say to the banks, how to say it, who to call, who don't bother calling. And uh, I show them all the different ways that they can research the officers at those banks. Um, get your foot in the door. Got you. Currently, right now, how many notes do you have in your portfolio? We're probably working 70 notes right now. Got you. Now, with uh, 70 notes going on, um, now, I, correct me if I'm wrong. That got to be a, 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 a massive amount of paperwork and a massive amount of accounting. How are you able to basically follow that process with 70 different projects going on at the same time? All right. So out of those 70, 60 of those I'm sitting on. I'm not mm -hmm. doing anything with them. Gotcha. I haven't called an attorney. I haven't started foreclosure. They're just sitting at the servicer and waiting for us to fire up that motor. <laughs> and gotcha. so uh, the 60 that we're sitting on, sometimes we get a call from a title company and they're like, hey, uh, Mr. So-and-so is selling his house and it looks like you have a mortgage on that property. Can you send over a payoff? And we're like, absolutely, we can send over a payoff. I, I have accounting software. The day that I bought that loan, I bored that loan into my accounting software that is made specifically for this type of investing. And as the months pass, the software keeps track of the interest and the late fees that are accruing. And by the time I hit print to send that copy over to the title company, interest and late fees have been accruing for all of these months or all of these years. And so what's really weird is this is really the only business where I've found that the longer you take to work alone, the more money you make. It's not like, <laughs> you know, it's not like if I had a vacant property uh, over here and I sat on it for two years, well, my taxes are accruing. I still have to have insurance on that property. And, uh, and so my holding costs are there with non-performing junior loans. There are very low, if any holding costs and the interest is accruing. And the added bonus is the borrower is paying on his first mortgage. So every month that that borrower makes a payment to his first mortgage, a little bit more principal gets paid down and right. it becomes a little bit more valuable. So I've got these, these ticking alarm clocks out there that someday the alarm is going to go off and we're going to get paid on these things. By the time we get to them, the, Maybe there's even a little appreciation, which makes our notes even more valuable because we're behind first mortgage. So uh, it's a it's a triple win for us 
by letting these things accrue. Nice. Now, I want to go ahead and reach out to everybody that's listening on the broadcast right now. Make sure you pop those questions down there on the different social sites that you are listening from. All of my fellow listeners from Instagram, from Facebook, from YouTube, from Twitch, hit those questions up. I'm going to personally reach out to my man, Daryl. Thank you for being on the broadcast. Henry, Ron, thank you for just joining us. Lorraine, thank you again. Minion, thank you again. You guys are really making this broadcast special for my guest, Mr. Thanks. Mike Rosica. Mike, I have to ask you this question, man. It sounds as if that this business could be extremely profitable when you're doing it right. What is your definition of doing this business right? Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. I, I guess it's, it's like any other thing. Um, it's like any other thing. And you of all people could explain this very well. Everyone, everything that we do in this life uh, starts with a decision. It comes with an idea and it starts with a decision. And if I made a decision to go out and now my father only, my father bought one house in his lifetime and that's the only house he ever purchased. Um, he never made the decision to buy that second or third property. I can tell you right now, even as a startup investor that has no capital, has really no experience, how do you, how do you get started? Well, you have to make a decision. Mm. So what's, it all starts with a decision. And that decision, once someone sparks your, your enthusiasm, is to say, you know what? I'm going to do that. I want to have five houses by the end of the year. So I have to make a decision. I will have five houses by the end of the year. And so now that you've made this decision, you've made this declaration, you now have to start doing the things that a person that owns five houses does. And what is that? It, going to meetings, talking to people, learning. It means if you don't have those five houses, it, it, it just means that you, there's something that you don't know yet. And it, it, by making that decision, I want to have five houses, you will start going to meetings. And the more important thing is you'll start hanging around with people that have five houses. What do people with five houses, what do they do differently from my father who only had one house. So you're going to change the people that you hang out with. You're going to change the things that you spend time learning that will get you to that five houses or 50 houses or 500 houses, whatever it is, you need to change what you're doing. If you want to get different results. Nice. My, my, my friend Javier wants to know, do you work with secondary banks as well as primary banks? I work with whoever I can, I talk to. Uh, a lot of people in this business say that, uh, just start with these small, uh, institute, these small banks, local banks. And I agree. You can start there. We have purchased and, or per, we have purchased from Wells Fargo. They don't sell anymore, but we are purchasing through kind of a trickle effect from PNC, which bought out National City. They have a ton of product. Uh, so here's these giant banks actually working with us that you would think that big, big banks wouldn't work with you. So it's everybody and anybody. There's 6,000 banks in this country that have some form of non-performing debt and then there are institutions, small institutions like myself and larger institutions that are actually funds that have put together 25, 50, 100 million in um, capital that they're out buying this product. And um, then the, this paper moves all around and there is this whole secondary market that we all swim around in today. 
Got it. Hey, Tori, welcome to the broadcast. Guys, if you are loving this information, I want to see you like it up. I want you to wow it up. I want you to heart it up. I want to see those likes, those hearts, and those wows right now if you're really digging this information that my man Mike is breaking down to you. Now, Mike, I'm going to ask you the million-dollar question right here. And this is something that everybody is wondering. All the gurus say you should do wholesaling. No, you should do buying, and hold, investing. No, you should do a virtual investor. No, no, you should do rehabbing. Why should someone do note investing? Do it all. You can, you can do, you, you can have your, when I left my, my full-time re, uh, whole, um, rehabbing of houses, I, I was learning this note business at night. Uh, the webinars were at 7 p.m., and then I was going out and meeting with the folks that were on, on those webinars and um, getting together with them once a month at the local RIA meetings to learn this business. I wish, I wish I didn't, you know, looking back is always a lot easier than looking forward. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I didn't take so long to do some of the things that I did. And that's what I think my mentoring program does is I'm like, wait a minute. I know where you're going to go with this. Don't bother. Don't waste your time. Just do this. And I can jumpstart that, that process because it took me so long. Now I had a great mentor who jumpstarted me incredibly, but there was still a lot of things that I could have shortcutted had I uh, done some type of a one-on-one -on -one mentorship instead of in a group format that we were in. So, uh, I, I I forget the question. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I want you to go down that pathway of why should I invest in note investing if instead of wholesaling or rehabbing oh. or buying and holding? I say you can wholesale during the day and learn a note business at night. And hey, I thought real I thought real estate investing in uh, two family houses was the best thing until you find the next best thing. I'm not saying jump from one shiny object to the next. Right. If you're wholesaling now and it's bringing in a paycheck, perfect. Now you got some time to mess around with this and really investigate to see if this is something for you or not. Because it's not for everybody. It, it is totally not for everybody. And you have to stick your toe in the water. Now, in my mind, wholesaling, or maybe somebody's not going to like this, but Wholesaling and rehabbing is not investing. Wholesaling and rehabbing is work. And you have to go find the next deal, and then you find the next deal, and then you find the next deal. With note investing, I'm buying and accumulating for my own consumption down the road. Okay, so as I collected these 70 or 80 loans that I'm working on, working through, when I get a loan and we start the process of foreclosure to get the borrower to wake up to the fact that we do own their mortgage, we get a chunk of money up front to bring the loan current to reinstate the loan. And then we've got 20 years or 30 years worth of monthly payments to collect those payments coming in. And once the payments start coming in from that one, we go to the next one. Well, that's not like wholesaling. You get paid when you're wholesaling and you're done. Unless you keep a portion of the deal mm -hmm. to keep your foot in the door and stay in the deal, you have to go out and find another and another. Well, I'm going out and find another and another loan for my own consumption. And to me, that – now, granted, these things do depreciate, but my bank account appreciates because they're making monthly payments. So as this $50,000 mortgage gets paid down to $20,000, that means that that $30,000 ended up in my bank account. So they do depreciate, but your bank account appreciates. And so I'm okay with that. Got you. Last but not least, Mike, I want you to bust one myth that most people have wrong about note investing. Notes are risky. Mm. So the myth is, yes, 
if somebody walked up to me and said, I want to get in the note business, here's 20 grand. <laughs> I'm like, here you go, man. Good luck. See ya. Have fun. That's a risky move for that person. That's a gutsy move, but it's a risky move. So how do you how do you mitigate and eliminate risk? And that's simply through education and learning how to do the due diligence so that you are mitigating and eliminating risk. Um, now, I look at these loans like I'm buying a used car. Everybody on this broadcast has bought a used car, right? You start out, buy yourself a used car, six, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000. You're not putting a hundred thousand dollars down to buy a three thousand dollar mortgage so everybody can come up with eight grand and get into this business and that's why it attracted appealed to me because i was a machinist my whole life you know i i walked in the back door of a factory just like everybody else and i was making metal parts for the first 40 years of my career and um when i found this business I realized that I could mitigate the risk by taking action and learning of as much about the business as possible. Nice. Now I know your time is, is, is so precious, man, but the questions are flying in. Do you have about another five minutes to go? I got, I got, I got these guitars. That they're waiting for me back here. And, and, and that comes to another thing. I made a decision. I'm 60 years old. Mm -hmm. I made a decision that I'm going to be a good guitar player. And so I, I'm horrible at it right now, but I know that if I keep up with it, that decision that I made six months ago to be a good guitar player will at some point come true. So I just, I, I love the concept and I, and I keep coming back to it. And um, that, that first decision is everything. So what do you got for me? Javier wants to know, do you often get homeowners that don't pay? And if so, what do you consider the best exit strategy? I've got some right now. Um, the, the lawyer called me up and said, that ain't going to happen. I'm like, well, there's not too much of an alternative here. Uh, another thing that my father said when I was a kid was, you got to pay your mortgage or you'll lose your house. So my exit strategy is, just keep plowing forward with the foreclosure until they realize that you're not messing around. And then they become your best friend once they start working with you. But some of them just refuse to pay or some of them come in and say, I'll give you 2000 bucks. And I'm like, that doesn't even cover my attorney costs. So we're going to have to come up with a different plan here. Um, some of them, I say, you know what, you're right something will happen either the person moves out and i'll get paid or there's some type of a life change right and people have to sell their houses at some point and when people sell their houses i get paid <laughs> so because i'm using my own capital for this uh like i said i'm buying these little used car prices really cheap stuff i can afford to sit on them because the payoffs that I'm getting on the other ones far outweigh the expenses of the ones that I sit on. And so uh, that's essentially it. I know. I remember one time listening to you give a presentation on the topic. And one of the things that really struck a nerve with a lot of the investors in the room was when you mentioned that you don't have to deal with any tenants, you have to deal with any trash, you don't have to deal with any toilets. It was all the passivity that really attracted you to this this level. Yeah, I, you know, we, my wife and I, just started to like to travel. We used to we used to be really homebodies. I think Charles, you kind of got me out a little bit. You got me on a cruise a couple of years ago, and I'm like, hey, you know what? After the your cruise, we spent two weeks in Florida just driving around, visiting relatives and other investors. Um. We can live out of a suitcase for, for three weeks. It's not going to kill us. And now while we're down in Florida, the only time I really couldn't work the business was while I was on a cruise ship. Uh, the internet was horrible. And, and yeah. We were doing too much partying anyway. So um, 
I'm not going to get a lot done. But when we were in Florida, I set up my laptop, my cell phone, and uh, I'm, I'm in business. I, I've got my son and my daughter both work for me full time. And uh, so they kind of man the, man the machine while I'm uh, out having a good time. And uh, so it works well for us. Man, it sounds like it's not all work. It sounds like there's a higher purpose in this business that has allowed you to, for lack of a better word, live the life of your dreams. It's, it's a life that we, my wife says she designed it from the beginning. Nice. Uh, she's a lot, she was and is a lot more into the spiritual side of life than I was uh, mm -hmm. from a little kid. She was saying, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful to have what we have and grateful to have this family. And um, she came from a, a very stable home and uh, she was able to, to recognize very early on that you can design your life. You don't wait for life to happen to you. When I was a kid, life just happened to me. Like I took the job, whatever, somebody offered me a job, I took it. I didn't go out and pursue what I wanted. I didn't know what I wanted. And so once, again, coming back to the word decision, once you decide what you your life should look like, then you can start going in that path. But as a kid, for me, it was, it was just life was just how it came to me, however it came to me. I go uh, make a left and make a right. I didn't know where I had no direction. And uh, these past oh, maybe 15 years now, I've really been studying how to design the life uh, that you truly can. And um, if I made a decision tomorrow to go out and buy 50 houses and I want to do it with zero money, just as an experiment, uh, I think that'd be cool. I started, I started a uh, retirement account with eleven thousand dollars, and I wanted to see how fast and how quickly I could grow it. And it's staggering. Once you make a decision to go in a direction, to take that eleven thousand bucks and go buy a couple of little notes, and turn that over and snowball that and snowball that and get payments from that payment. I was looking more for payoffs from those loans. N meaning negotiating a larger sum up front and then no payments mm -hmm. in the future so that I could snowball that money faster uh, as an experiment. And <laughs> they're having a lot of, we just, we're just goofing around, you know, and uh, you, you can, you can do some amazing things once you make a decision to do them. Got you, man. Last but not least, if someone wants to reach out to you and get your help in designing their life, how can you get in contact with you? Yeah, if you just go to uh, note conference, N O T E conference.com, and schedule a call with me. Um, my 15 minute call usually goes on for more than a half an hour because I love talking about what I love talking about. I know. I can hear it in your voice, man. <laughs> yeah, <really? laughs> I, 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 I I've been doing this 13 years. I still get as enthusiastic as the day that I heard about it. Um, I, I love seeing other people become successful. That, that, I, I love people call me up and say, man, I just got to pay off. And uh, it wasn't for the full amount, but it was pretty darn close to it. And uh, that, that gets me going. All right. And, uh, whether they're getting into brokering notes or buying notes, um, for themselves, for their own consumption, or, or working with another investor, or whatever the picture looks like, let's do it. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate your precious time. I'm going to let you go ahead and get back to designing your life with your wife and the beautiful kids, you guys. And you just have a fantastic day. Once again, guys, if you want to reach out to Mike, you can hit him at, at noteconference.com. Sign up for one of those conference calls, one of those 15-minute uh, brainstorming sessions, and he'll take you down the right path of designing your yeah, life. Yeah, cool. And, and to your family, Charles, as well. Uh, we've, we've got to see quite a bit of you guys. I know. And, um, we always enjoy your company. So and we got the crab cakes waiting for you next time you come to town, my brother. Crab cakes for us and I got Alaskan king crabs for you. 
Excellent, man. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you spending your time with us today. This is Charles Blair, the Mad Scientist, signing out. And we'll see you on the next episode of Do Rue Interviews. Bye-bye. <laughs>